Okay, perfect. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is to thank Dr. Amani for that excellent presentation. It was all encompassing. It covered a wide range of issues. And I have to say that as she was speaking, I was busy deleting the slides that I had prepared because she'd been so comprehensive. But what, what, what she has done in doing so is give me the privilege of being much shorter in my remarks, but also in sharing my views and setting aside my official speech, which uh, I think would have uh, covered almost similar ground that she had covered. But also what I'd like to do is to share the perspective of someone who is now working with countries who find themselves in this unprecedented crisis. But before I begin that, I'd like to share with you a picture that uh, Professor Colin Kirkpatrick uh, gave me on my graduation. I don't know where in the archives he found it, but this is a picture of my father in 1973 uh, at the Institute, uh, continuing the tradition of civil servants who were benefiting from the work that the University of Manchester was doing for newly independent states. And I think the curiosity that he enjoyed in Manchester with a wide range of people coming from all over the continent, certainly I'd like to believe seeded some level of curiosity that now finds me working at the World Bank and having the privilege of, of working with many that I see on this screen. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Kirkpatrick and David Hume and the entire faculty at the university who continue to do a fabulous job. There, there's an endless list of countries that I have visited on in my current role where a, a Manchester alumni has been able to open doors and make my life 10 times easier than would have otherwise been the case. So thank you very much. And it, it, it is really a great privilege to participate in this celebration. Let me focus on COVID-19. And what I'd like to do with this session is essentially three things. Uh, give you an overview of what COVID has, uh, what we're dealing with with COVID. Focus on Africa for a little while, and then come back and speak and really reinforce a lot of the messages that Dr. Amani highlighted in her remarks. So the first thing is to recognize just how unprecedented this this crisis is. Um, all of our projections indicate that we are losing a significant amount of people back into poverty. Um, uh, we've lost a number of people back into poverty this year. On any given year, purely on account of natural disasters, we have been seeing as many as 26 million people go back into poverty. Now, what I like to remind people is the mere fact that we have COVID doesn't mean that earthquakes and hurricanes have gone on, on leave. They are still out there. They're still ravaging the world. And so we have a multiplicity of crisis that is impacting us significantly. A second area that we are increasingly concerned with is the rising um, hunger and acute food insecurity that we see in different parts of the world. Now, because of technology, because of the, the improvements in weather forecasting, we can tell that we are at the beginning of some levels of famine in some parts of the world for which we need to, to prepare for. Um, Dr. Mani spoke about the impact that uh, COVID has had on education, all of the challenges that we have had uh, on, on climate. Uh, although I have to say the reduction on vehicle transport in Washington has, has done wonders to the quality of the air here. So <laughs> perhaps there is some, some good coming out of this. In, in Africa, we've seen a large number of cases. Now, comparatively, you will repeatedly hear that compared to other regions of the world, not least the US here, the absolute numbers of deaths are lower. But we have to take into account the fact that um, there has been good policies that has made this possible. There are regions where the level of testing may not be as high as we imagine it to be, or rather we would require it to be. But one death is one death too many on the continent is what I'd like to say. And what, it, what worries me even more is not the physical deaths that we, we're enduring, but it is the economic deaths that we have to suffer. Uh, we are suffering. So if you just take one of the key statistics on, 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 on employment, 
we currently have about 400 million youth within the, between the age of 15 and 35. These are the working population. And to this population, we're adding about 10 million who are coming into the, to the job market every year. Pre-COVID, we were only generating 3 million jobs to absorb this 10 million, to 10 million youth. Now in this environment where there's been, a, 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 we've pressed the brakes on a number of industries, a number of service sectors to introduce social distancing, we are way below that 3 million. So this number of youth that are coming into the job market will only continue to increase. And so the economic impact is something that we are severely uh, concerned about. Now, it's important to also put things into perspective that increasingly as Africa has found its voice, has found its feet in terms of manufacturing exports and has reintegrated in the world, re reintegrated in, its, in the world much more in recent years than we have seen. The impact of COVID in other parts of the, of the region, of the world, will also have a negative impact, a feedback loop on the continent in terms of export opportunities, manufacturing opportunities. And so over the last six months, one of the things that we've been doing at the World Bank is we're using our country-based um, um, platform to monitor the impact of, of COVID in other parts of the world. And so when we hear of Bangladesh losing as many as 2 million jobs in the garment industry because that value chain has been negatively affected, when we look at smaller countries like Nepal losing a million jobs because they, the migrant workers that were going to the Gulf are unable to do it, and unusually or rather unprecedented, we've actually seen a decline in migrant remittances. Uh, now, the typical trend in previous crises is that when there's been a health crisis or there's been an economic shock somewhere, rem remittances tend to increase. So for the first time to see this dipping of migrant remittances, because job markets in Europe, in, in Asia and elsewhere are shrinking, is a double whammy for a lot of households on the continent. So as we talk about the, as we start to pivot and start thinking about what is a post-COVID envir economic environment in Africa look like, um, the first point to, 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 to accept is that the, the prospects aren't very high at this moment. Uh, for the first time in 25 years, we, we're going to see a, an economic recession uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so this contraction is coming from a very low base. And so a lot of the economic projections especially in tourism, in a lot of the service sectors where Africa had begun to do exceptionally well, tourism was picking up significantly. And so when a country like Malawi loses 35,000 jobs in tourism, the impact is quite significant. And so as we monitor these contractions, one of the things that the bank has been trying to do is to begin to work with policymakers to not only um, make sure that we have sufficient resources to deal with the immediate impact, but also to start thinking about what that long-term impact and what that long-term resilience begins to look like. And so over the last um, three, um, over the last five months during the COVID pandemic, uh, we've had to scale up the fundraising role that we have done uh, for the poorest economies, for the IDA, uh, IDA countries. We've also accelerated a lot of the health pro pro projects around the continent. And right now we are working in over 114 countries. We have increased the amount of funding directly going into health to about $14 billion. Uh, we expect between now and June 2001 to provide an additional 150 billion dollars. While these numbers sound large, by the time you have spread these resources across the entire continent, across the 74 countries that benefit from either countries, you look at those that are highly debt distressed, you look at those in FCVs, these amounts are not, not adequate by any measure. Um, to give you an example, right now we're talking about the development of a vaccine. The a lot of the developed countries have made advanced purchases of the vaccines that are still in development. 
So for a lot of developing countries, what the bank has been trying to do together with Gavi and others is to make sure that as these vaccines are being developed, there is sufficient uh, stock that is going to be available for, for developing countries, including uh, in Africa. So to that extent, there's been some effort within the bank over the last couple of months to set aside $12 billion simply to go to the, to the issue of vaccines. And one of the other related issues around vaccines is to also note, note that in a health crisis, a health pandemic of this nature, one of the things that you would expect to see is an increase in health expenses across uh, uh, developing countries. What we haven't, that we haven't seen, we've seen health expenses remain the same. And so what that tells you, or what, what, what that, the caution that you immediately uh, begin to think of is whether efforts that are going into responding to the COVID uh, crisis, rightly so, is not diverting resources from malaria and other uh, diseases that we've had on, on the continent. The other point I'd like to, to emphasize as we talk about the response to the crisis is to remind people that the world was not in a good place uh, pre-COVID, that growth had been relatively stagnant for, for quite a while. And so any declines in growth, any declines in, in, in productivity are already coming from a relatively low base. Um, when we think about the, the issue of debt, um, I hear what Dr. Amina uh, uh, said about China and the, the impact that um, the, the conversations around, around debt. And as respectful as I will be to my own continent, to my own country of Zambia, the level of indebtedness has reached a point where it is not sustainable for a number of these countries. Now, a few decades ago, it was much, I was about to say relatively easy, but this easy is not the word to use when it comes to debt, but it was certainly easier to convene Paris Club members to talk about a global debt solution such as HIPIC. In this environment where the number of creditors is much more diverse, it is going to be increasingly much more difficult. There are a large number of countries that have gone to the market, they have contracted private debt. So yes, we must talk about the 80% that Dr. Amina referred to. The challenge that institutions such as the bank have is that that 80% is quite disaggregated, that the level of transparency associated with that 80% is quite opaque. And therefore, when it comes to countries such as Zambia has been trying to do over the last couple of months of convening private creditors, getting them to participate in a debt suspension initiative, the environment today is incredibly much more difficult than it, than it, it has been in the past. Um, and I won't even go into any of the other uh, challenges that the continent and the world have been dealing with. I'll just focus on the humanitarian crisis that I'd referred to earlier. Um, every year we're spending about $165 million responding to different crises at, at different times. If you speak to people at the UN, they'll tell you that there was a time in, in the not too distant future when a level four crisis was something that you experienced once or twice in a year. Increasingly, we have four level four crises taking place. Uh, a COVID pandemic in this environment, together with all of the crises, um, that are all actually taking place means that the, the amount of stress that is taking place is quite high. We had a conference only two, um, possibly last week with, a, with the finance ministers of several small states. If you think about the Caribbean states where, which are tourist dependent, which are dependent on, a, on four cruise liners or floating thousands of people to spend the day the amount of those dollar revenues have suddenly disappeared. So when you lose that, that level of revenue, then you have a hurricane sweep through, you are already highly indebted, then put all of those together and you have the perfect storm that presents uh, significant challenges. Now, I don't want, this is a celebration of Africa's, uh, of Pan-Africanism, so I don't want to leave you with a highly depressed uh, message. Um, I did want to stress that 
there is significant conversations taking place, but for a, con a continent with the positive prospects that have been outlined by my previous speaker, there are opportunities, there are things that we should be thinking about in terms of going forward. So the first point, and I, and I referred to this um, just a few seconds ago, is the issue of debt. I think what COVID has done is accelerate the, the, the pace at which we have been able to uh, reveal the level of stress. It's forced this conversation that otherwise would have continued to fester for years to come. The fact that we now have, governments now have to in provide fiscal uh, provide a fiscal response has has revealed just how vulnerable uh, we are. As I said today, about half of the countries that we uh, are, are benefits who benefit from IDA are highly de debt distressed. Uh, in July this year, the World Bank introduced a new policy called the Sustainable uh, Development Financing Policy, which now compels us to um, meet with the authorities in every single country that either provides resources and talk about debt transparency, fiscal sustainability, and debt management. And out of these, out of these three areas come up with two or three policy actions that they need to implement in order to, for them to get their full uh, um, IDA allocation for the fiscal, for the year. Now, we will not be able to solve Africa's debt problems or indeed global debt problems with two or three policy actions. But I think certainly it will increase the level of transparency that's, that is being shown on the issue of debt. And the, the World Bank will be working closely with the IMF and counting on academic civil society and others to, to insist on greater transparency when it comes to debt contracting. The second area is health. Prior to the pandemic uh, hitting us, the continent was making tremendous progress in terms of reducing child mortality, in terms of vaccinations, in terms of this basic quality of healthcare. Um, I think the the, the spotlight that COVID has done has, has provided, again, is to demonstrate that we still have a long way to go in terms of basic things such as storage, basic things like providing gloves. My sister is a surgeon at uh, the second largest hospital in, 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 in Zambia and repeatedly will tell me just how some basic equipment is missing, things that we take for granted in other parts of the world. We still have a long way to go. And because of the nature of COVID, even if a vaccine was, de was developed today, just the mere transportation and distribution and the cold storage facilities that you would need to make sure that you're able to, to support substantial portions of the population means that even as we provide additional health resources, the authorities on the continent, um, it, this is an opportunity to, to sit back to rethink how we deliver health services, to have a good go at revisiting the combination of public and private health facilities using new instruments that are out there, such as uh, health insurance mechanisms. It's, it's an important time, and unless we invest adequately in things like health, long-term human capital development on the continent will be limited. My favorite subject is, is, is that of the youth on the continent. I, I, I simply, continue to be amazed at how, um, how creative, how connected a lot of the youth are. And one of the things which has been the basis upon, upon which Africa has seen substantial growth, taking into a account that in a number of these economies, 80% uh, of the population is in the informal sector. Um, it, and a lot of these companies don't have the social protection systems that we see elsewhere. That social protection system, that cushion for economic development have been a number of youth who have created businesses that are generating employment for themselves and others and have been the shock absorber for a lot of economic uh, challenges that the continent continues to face. And so even as COVID hits that 3 million formal jobs that are created annually to absorb the 10, um, I think the 
the full potential for the continent is on the rim, on, on where the other, the remaining youth are going in terms of self-employment and into the informal sector. Um, so I actually welcome um, in, in the search of optimism in the depressing times, the fact that working online has forced a number of governments to really think about the availability of bandwidth, to look at the level of connectivity and to move away from the notion that once we put a mobile phone in every person's hand, the job is done. The real work with mobile connectivity is on the back end, the fiber optics, the hardware that makes sure that we're able to continually bring the costs of, of financing internet technology. For the, 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 the importance of bringing it down much, much further so that as my children here in Washington enjoy 24, our access to internet connectivity, my, their cousins in my home village in Southern province are able to do the same, which is just not the case today. And so that investment, this is an, another opportunity that shines light to that investment and I, I welcome it. I've spoken to the issue of jobs. Um, we, there is a long conversation about what does a good job mean for in Africa? Is it a manufacturing job? Is it a service job? Is, and so, when we have this conversation about the type of jobs that need to be created in order to sustain long-term development, again, people are, are, are having these conversations in ways that we, we perhaps have not had adequately uh, in time. Related to the issue of debt is a question of where this money is going to and how it is being spent. And if it's going into infrastructure, is it creating access to markets for farmers that otherwise would not have had it? If it's investment into electricity, is it able to then support 24-hour um, service manufacturing that then attracts a lot of investments? Now, one of the things which uh, always uh, sort of people forget um, is the fact that oftentimes we focus on attracting investment to Africa. And yet, over the last decade or so, increasingly foreign investment is actually uh, money coming from one African country to the other, crossing the border and making that investment uh, um, local. When we start talking about, and, and sometimes we, we underestimate the full growth potential by focusing on formal sources of information such as stock markets. And yet when you take the time to go country by country and look at the actual statistics, you find that Africa's largest indigenous grown firms are not listed on their domestic stock in stock market. They are still held in private hands. They're still making significant investments. And so to the question from the other um, session that we've just had about data, uh, I think this is a, a primary uh, priority for the continent. We must invest in getting the right data so that people are able to understand the, the sources of growth areas of potential investment and, and critically for the idea of creating jobs with which markets uh, they should invest in. The other opportunity is that around trade. What COVID has done for a lot of um, services and industries is to disrupt value chains across the globe that have seen manufacturing in one region provide exports in, in another. Of course, it, is, it has been disrupted we are losing significant jobs. And I did refer to the 2 million jobs in the garment industry in Bangladesh that are being lost. You can, you can see that chain uh, right across the globe and it is, it is a cause for significant concern. And for any African country today, for the continent as a whole, it is really important to begin to ask the question, how do we rebuild these value chains that benefits the continent? It's wonderful that, you know, a year ago, is it two years ago already, that the Continental Free Trade Agreement was signed. This is the time to accelerate investment in making sure that as, as the continent, as, as countries worldwide, the US is no exception, European uh, countries are no exception, think about how to make sure that they're not vulnerable to these global disruptions and begin to invest locally, that Africa does the same that it looks to its neighbors to make sure that trade, trade links are rebuilt in a way that benefits the continent even more than it has done in recent decades. Um, 
I could go on with a number of this, but let me just summarize my, my remarks by saying that yes, COVID has been devastating for the continent, for the globe, it has been disruptive. Um, I spent 24 seven, um, I mean, I, my team spends a lot of time with countries and governments that are highly, that are already distressed requiring additional revenues uh, at a time when their domestic tax revenues have fallen significantly. And we must respond to that. Um, as, as much as I hate going back to the our traditional donors who have been exceptionally generous with the rest, last round of, of, of um, the IDA replenishment process that were generous enough to provide 82 billion for the next three years, um, I have to go back to them for more because if we don't raise additional resources to respond to this crisis, the recovery will even be longer. Um, the point I want to emphasize is that as we deal with COVID, we should not forget the long-term prospects, uh, the long-term reforms that the continent had started to make that had begun to show real prospects. And this is lifting barriers to trade and investment uh, and undertaking substantive fiscal reforms to make sure that even as we take on additional debt and not all debt is bad, we are able to manage it in a manner that is sustainable, that we promote uh, competitive markets, increasingly local markets. And this is not just across African continents, but even within countries, uh, the, the amount of food waste that we continue to experience because we're not able to get rural products to the urban markets in time or in a manner that allows them to sell at the right product is continues to be a challenge. Um, I think in the financial sector, we're making it much more democratic. I think the phone has been revolutionary in that regard. But as I said earlier, at some point, even as we benefit from mobile technology, from connectivity and financial sector reforms, now is the time to revisit the hardware that goes on the back end to make sure that we are able to leverage this even more. So there, there is plenty of scope for institutional reforms. And if uh, you know, 75 years ago, the, our, our forefathers met in Manchester to talk about political independence, our generation must meet again in Manchester to talk about economic independence, sustainable economic independence that allows us to respond um, with, with, with purpose. And in conclusion, I just want to leave um, four, four words that sort of bring, that I think about every day. I, I, I work with many of my counterparts on, on the continent. And, and just as an aside, one of the real pleasures of, of going to an institution like Manchester is that increasingly, when I'm going to a Uganda, a Malawi, a Tanzania, and I walk into a ministry, I'm meeting my own counterparts. We've had the same privileges, the same education, and it is incumbent upon us to really think about what it is we want for Africa. You know, when we meet again in Manchester and when our children meet in Manchester 75 years uh, from now, what is it that we will have done for the continent that will have, uh, have uh, made an impact? The second issue is around process. The process of development is, is messy. It's not a straight line. Um, it, in, in, in most cases, the lasting solutions are homegrown. Uh, um, but I do want to say that um, the, the exchange of ideas, one of the things that I've found an incredible privilege being an African at the World Bank with a lot of other colleagues within the institution who are from third world countries who care deeply about, uh, about our own institutions, even when the policies of the institution, the policies of development, the consensus at any particular given time may be quite alien to what we, 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 we believe in. That constant struggle, the, the constant testing of ideas um, is, is something that I, I have come to appreciate and enjoy because there is no ultimate best case scenario of policies that work. So when David uh, thinks I'm being generous about coming to Manchester every year, it's because I love sitting with students who will test me and who will challenge me and who will criticize the World Bank, who will give me a mirror that I can take back to Washington and say, perhaps we need to rethink some of the things that we're doing, which is a good thing. Um, finally, the, third, the third point I'd like to say about places is that develop what, what COVID has done is to sort of level the playing field. It's no longer enough to say, the, the poor developing countries over there have that problem and we have our problem. We all have a global problem that we need to fix. 
And e even as I go out to speak to uh, development, uh, sorry, to developed economies about, about raising additional money for, for countries that are in distress, it's not that I'm ignoring the fact that their own economies are, are, have been hit hard. I'm not ignoring the fact that their own citizens are demanding more for themselves, but I'm simply reminding them that distance is, is, a, is an irrelevant concept when it comes to, to, uh, to development. We must make sure that we all develop, otherwise um, um, we will be impacted um, negatively at some point. And my final word is about people, investing in people. Um, in my presentation, I made reference to the fact that we need to invest in health. You know, child mortality remains a huge problem. We need to invest in our youth and in terms of creating jobs on the continent, they themselves are investing in themselves. But it is also equally important that work that is taking place at the University of Manchester, other irreputable institutions around the world that are simply asking questions around development continues. Um, it is the only way that we can make sure that, that, that long-term we're able to make the progress that is expected of our own generation as complex and difficult an environment this may be. So with those few words, I'd like to thank you again for this invitation. I, am, I feel really privileged to, to be amongst friends and just look at this gallery and see so many familiar faces that, um, that, that um, I, I, I honestly think that this is a, a, a privilege to have this conversation. And I, I look forward to, to, the, to the rest of the uh, speakers and, and presentations that you've lined up uh, on this occasion. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it.